Okay, I think we should start. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first talk of the spring session. So I think it's been a while since our last talk, and I hope you all enjoyed the previous talks. So again, in case there are some new audience here, uh, this talk series will be uh, given by the awardees of NCU Delta Young Astronomers Lectureship, which was founded by uh, the National Central University and the Delta Electronics Foundation to recognize young scholars who have made outstanding contributions in this field. So each year, the awardee will be invited to Taiwan to give talks and interact with us. So the original plan was to invite all the previous awardees to come back to Taiwan. But um, unfortunately, we have to make this event fully online due to the, the, the pandemic. So our speaker today is uh, Professor Guo Daoling. So Professor Guo received this award in 2019, and he's now full professor in Stanford University. And he's a world expert in uh, observational cosmology, especially in studying the uh, polarization of CMB and uh, cosmic microwave background. Uh, I think it's our great pleasure to have him here. Uh, the title of his talk today is um, Dismystifying the Big Bang. So just a few announcements here. Please mute yourself uh, during the talk. You have, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the chat box. Uh, we'll come back to those questions in the middle of the talk or during the uh, Q&A session after the talk. All right, uh, Darling, I would let you take it away if you're ready. Well, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to share our result with you. So the timing of this uh, talk is uh, is very good because we just released our result, new result a few months ago. Um, so I'd be able to come back uh, and um, tell you about the new results uh, from our experiment at the South Pole. Can you hear me well? Yes, very well. Yes. Okay. So the subtitle of my talk is uh, experimental study of inflation. So I wanted to emphasize the experimental aspect of it because Big Bang was thought to be this um, one-off thing. Uh, in fact, the man who named it thought the hypothesis that all matter of the universe was created in one Big Bang, and that's the first time the word, um, the phrase was coined. Uh, at a particular time in the remote past is irrational and outside science. So he thought, Fred Hoyle thought, you know, Big Bang was just ridiculous. And it's not even wrong. It, it's, not, it's not only wrong, it's outside science. It's not even a scientific question. But now we think Big Bang actually happened and the universe was created uh, in one Big Bang. And we're actually studying the dynamics of it. Um, so... Uh, the context um, of the talk is, uh, is this new result that was just released by the BICEP collaboration of which I'm a principal investigator. Um, the bottom line is by measuring the BMO polarization in the cosmic microwave background, um, um, we were able to limit the contribution from tensor uh, or the primordial gravitational wave to the initial fluctuation to less than 0 0.036 at the two sigma significance. Um, so the uncertainty on that is uh, 0 0.009. So this is um, the new result and it's world's best, um, the strongest constraint on primordial gravitational waves. So how is that related to Big Bang? How is that related to inflation is the subject of my talk. So just first, uh, I wanna remind you what inflation is. So since we know the universe started in a very hot dense state, um, and we knew this since the 1960s uh, after the discovery of cosmic microwave background uh, radiation, the 3K radiation, um, we know to a very high degree, the observed universe is very uniform. Uh, cosmic microwave background has the same temperature in all directions. Uh, it is flat, so there's a much longer story behind that, but it's geometrically flat, uh, and it's free of any topological defects that should have existed, um, according to the theorists, uh, since the early universe. Um, so we observe a universe that's uniform, isotropic, and it has no, you know, 
uh, defects like uh, monopoles. And this requires an explanation. Um, an early period of very rapid uh, or exponential expansion um, during the bank, essentially, um, can satisfactorily explain all these observations. Uh, and um, the process, uh, of course, is, uh, is later called uh, inflation. So this uh, inflation is not just a kinematics effect that explains um, the observables uh, in bullet number one. It's also a dynamical process uh, rooted in general relativity. So all you need is a ingredient, um, a scalar field, and then you plug into the uh, general relativity equations and it, it can achieve such a, a near exp exponential expansion. Um, and as a bonus, uh, inflation predicts density fluctuations uh, with properties um, that's consistent with the uh, observation. In particular, uh, the spectral index or the, um, the spectrum, uh, the, the, the spectrum of the initial fluctuation uh, as a function of weight number or length uh, agrees very well uh, with the observation. So how is that achieved? So if you haven't seen this, uh, this is a graphical view, graphical explanation of how inflation works. So the universe was, has a finite age. Um, so there is a horizon um, that grows as the university ages. So this is essentially speed of light times the age of the universe, right? So this is the red line here. And all the things, the galaxies, you know, new things emerging from the horizon kind of fall into this uh, observable universe as the observable universe grows. So one funny thing is we see more and more stuff in our universe, not counting the recent uh, cosmic acceleration. Um, but this stuff tend to have similar properties, uh, even though they didn't have time initially to come in thermal equilibrium uh, to basically acquaint themselves with all these uh, regions um, to, to be uniform. So if you look at the trajectories of these uh, galaxies or objects or raw materials, so all these things move out of, backward in time, move out of the um, observable universe line, which is the horizon line uh, at the pretty early um, instance. So you see these uh, blue lines uh, are you know, all um, outside of the red line. And yet we, see a very uniform universe now. So whatever comes in is similar to whatever is already in our observable universe at any time. So we need something that moves the blue line below the red line very early on. Okay, so we need something that can just kind of tuck all these trajectories inside the red uh, so that, you know, these things were in thermal equilibrium that explains why all this thing is uniform. And looking at it in the direction of time, this looks like an expansion of space, okay? So a rapid expansion of space, it is required to explain the uniformity of the observable universe. So you have to stare at this a little and draw some pictures uh, to convince you, yourself of that. Uh, but th this is a very like basic uh, reason why a rapid expansion, uh, expansion can explain uh, uniformity. Similarly, a rapid expansion can just blow up space. Um, and um, a very obvious effect of that is to flatten uh, the geometry, okay? So essentially, equivalently, what that's saying is the observable universe um, is only a small part of an enormous universe. And the enormous universe was the result of inflation. And because the true universe is much larger than the observable universe, if you measure the curvature, spatial curvature within the observable universe, you're gonna get a very small number. So the curvature is going to be very small. Uh, if you measure the curvature of the earth uh, over 10 meters, of course, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna decide that the earth is very flat. Uh, and it, it's a bit like that. So the scales in observable universe is very small compared to the true size of the universe. And you know, as long as the universe is large, it doesn't matter whether it's flat or curved in one way or another. 
uh, it, it's very, very large compared to the observable universe. And that's what makes it flat. So like I said, um, the required exponent, uh, exponential expansion is achieved um, in general relativity. And what you need is a very slowly varying scalar, scalar field. And it is well known that a scalar field will have certain type of uh, energy momentum uh, tensor. Uh, and uh, if you're not familiar with general relativity, that's okay. Uh, this is just a, a relativistic version of Poisson's equation uh, Newton in Newtonian physics. So you have field on one side and you have source on the other, uh, and you get the field. Um, and this is the um, energy momentum tensor for a scalar. Um, it has a potential term and it has a uh, kinetic energy term. For a slowly varying scalar field, uh, the potential term dominate, okay? And the uh, kinetic energy is subdominant. And in that case, plug into just this very equation, what you get is a Hubble expansion with a nearly constant Hubble parameter uh, determined by um, uh, the, the, scale, uh, the potential. Uh, of the scalar field, V of phi, okay? So if V of phi is roughly constant, you have an exponential growth, and that gives you uh, an inflationary uh, universe uh, pretty early on. Of course, this field will have to decay later, uh, to, and the V will have to approach zero, otherwise the universe will just continue uh, inflating, and we're, gonna, we're not gonna be able to see our current universe uh, when um, uh, uh, dominated by dark energy and dark, dark matter. Uh, it will be dominated by this V. So this V must uh, decay away. Um, and uh, on a time scale that's very slow compared to Hubble rate, uh, but uh, it has to decay away pretty rapidly before all the standard Big Bang uh, processes started. Okay. So in terms of the generation of fluctuation, um, during inflation, um, you can think of um, different co-moving wavelengths um, corresponds to a Fourier mode. Uh, and a Fourier mode um, is evolving, uh, each Fourier mode is evolving independently because you know, everything was linear, everything was small. And uh, the result of that is um, the Fourier modes don't talk to each other. Uh, and during inflation, um, each Fourier mode is assigned a random number, essentially a random amplitude. And um, random, that random amplitude um, um, just creates um, initial density fluctuation um, that later on. Um, so this um, is a shrinking horizon during inflation uh, as the Fourier modes are leaving the horizon during inflation and inflation ends. And then later on standard Big Bang happens and that's where all the blue lines re-enter into, um, into our horizon. Uh, and each Fourier mode is doing, doing that uh, and evolving independently, you can think of it that way. Um, so the solution of that Fourier mode in linear equation um, looks like this, it's oscillation until horizon exit. And then it's oscillating again uh, after re-entrance uh, into the horizon. Uh, that's after the inflation ends. And you can think of it as you know, quantum mechanics during inflation assigned uh, an amplitude, a random amplitude to each, uh, each of the, this uh, for, uh, Fourier mode. And um, we're given like a spectrum of noise and, um, and then gravity takes over and uh, if you have over dense region, uh, it grows, uh, the amplitude grows and uh, oscillates um, uh, and producing, and after decoupling, after the inverse got uh, cold enough for uh, electrons to be captured by the protons, uh, you have the snapshot of this noise uh, and uh, it was uh, quantum mechanic mechanically generated uh, during inflation. So, there is a direct comparison of inflation 
which is uh, creates this shrinking uh, horizon. And all the modes, all the noise that we observe uh, at a given instance right here at the cosmic microwave background era, 400,000 years after Big Bang. Okay. So, first you do is you can Fourier transform this temperature fluctuation, which corresponds to temperature uh, density fluctuation. Um, oh, um, of course, the later part of the story is this initial density fluctuation evolves, get amplified under gravity, uh, and grow into galaxies and planets, uh, and um, and all, all the structures that we see uh, in the present universe. So um, the key ingredient, as I said, um, for all of that to happen is a scalar field that rolls sufficiently slowly downhill for sufficiently long, okay? So it's really a very generic field. So we only know one scalar field in physics so far, and that is the Higgs field. Uh, and um, people knew pretty early on in the 1980s that um, Higgs field uh, is very difficult or, or even impossible to produce uh, inflation. Uh, you have to add more bells and whistles for that to work. But the, the bare minimum Higgs field will not, is not uh, the inflation field. So we need another scalar field that rolls down sufficiently slowly uh, for sufficiently long. So the initial idea by Goose uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a field uh, that's stuck in the false vacuum, rough, roughly constant V. And just by um, staying at roughly constant uh, V, uh, it's an inflation. But the problem of that is it, it's inflation forever. Um, the quantum tunneling that will get to um, true vacuum is not going to be efficient enough to end inflation. Um, then, of course, um, uh, Linde pretty quickly realized that you don't need false vacuum at all, as long as uh, the field changes slowly enough, um, it, it can give rise to inflation. And this uh, kinetic energy is subdominant compared to potential energy um, that gives you uh, just as good uh, inflation with all the properties needed to explain the classical uh, Big Bang problems. Um, a little more math here. So this is basically what I've written. Um, the Hubble parameter, uh, a dot over a uh, square is proportional to v to zeros order. Um, so that's the constant exponential, uh, constant Hubble exponential expansion. Um, leading order beyond that uh, is what we call a slow roll parameter. So the first derivative of that v field um, the dimensionless quantity of that uh, has to be small to produce what we saw, as well as the second derivative. So the inflation potential uh, has to be um, dominant over kinetic energy. And that's what this term represents, really. Um, but in addition to that, the curvature has to be uh, small. So it has to be flat to leading order uh, and also to second order. So these are the so-called slow roll parameter. And to this uh, linear leading order, um, you can predict pretty much all the observables. So we have observed uh, the density fluctuation in the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and that initial uh, fluctuation power spectrum is given uh, expressed in slow roll parameter as Hubble squared divided by epsilon. Epsilon is this uh, derivative of V with respect to phi, phi field, not time derivative. And at the same time, there is a gravitational wave background produced by the same process. And that is given uh, in terms of um, the slow roll parameter or these parameters as just H squared. And you can see it's directly, pro directly proportional to uh, the potential or the uh, the energy scale of inflation v of phi, and if you take the ratio of the two, um, the tensor to scalar ratio, or also known as r uh, for ratio, uh, it's given 
by 16 times epsilon. Epsilon is this uh, derivative. And this term is coming from here uh, in the denominator. It turns out the scalar fluctuation has uh, epsilon in the denominator. Uh, and the tensor fluctuation or the gravitational wave is directly proportional uh, to V. And you, when you take the ratio, it's proportional to uh, the first derivative of V. And the spectral index of scalar fluctuation, uh, scalar here, N sub S uh, is, um, or the difference of that and one and unity uh, is given by a minus six times uh, epsilon, the first slower parameter, plus two times um, eta, the curvature parameter. So this is just simple um, calculus. Uh, basically. And you can just imagine, you can just draw a potential and ask yourself how much gravitational wave you will produce and how much uh, scalar field, uh, scalar fluctuation will produce, and what is the spectrum of the produced uh, uh, scalar fluctuation. And then those are the observables uh, so far. So that um, power spectrum um, fluctuation observed in the cosmic micro background scalar uh, density fluctuation uh, can be converted into a power spectrum, angular power spectrum, and compare with the theoretical calculation. And this is the result from uh, the Planck satellite. Um, this is, uh, I believe, the most uh, updated result released in 2018. So the red points were the measurements, and the blue line is the theoretical calculation with the right ingredient. Um, and this is the temperature spectrum, and this is the uh, TE, the temperature to uh, the scalar uh, polarization, scalar generated polarization, cross correlation. And you can see the spectacular agreement between the theoretical calculation and the measurement. So from the initial spectrum um, to a spectrum like this, an angular spectrum like this that can be compared um, is all linear physics. It's just um, linear wave oscillating uh, in a plasma. It's not even plasma physics. It's just linear ENM uh, with uh, gravity, uh, with classical gravity, uh, really. Um, so you can imagine inverting the observed power spectrum to get back the original uh, input, the linear uh, power spectrum in 3D, in three dimensions. So this is an observed two-dimensional um, angular spectrum, uh, the, the temperature uh, angular spectrum. And you can invert this to get you the initial density fluctuation in 3D created directly by inflation, right? And that inversion will be very good because uh, all, the physic, all the physics between a linear 3D uh, spectrum uh, initial fluctuation and this uh, 2D is all well known, and there's very little, uh, basically no uncertainty behind that. So you do need correct input ingredients, and those are the uh, correct uh, dark matter, um, correct amount of dark matter, correct amount of um, baryons, uh, correct amount of uh, dark energy, uh, and a spatially flat uh, universe. Um, and with that, uh, you can reconstruct what the input linear 3D spectrum is needed to give you um, the observed angular power spectrum. And the result of that uh, over the last 30 years are summarized in these three figures. So the first one is the result by Colby. Okay, so the x-axis is the wave number uh, measured in, uh, inverse megaparsec, okay? The co-moving wave number measured in uh, inverse megaparsec. Um, so in Kobe, you know, it can be anything. It's, um, it can be flat or, or not. It could be scale invariant or not scale invariant. But in WMAP, we really start to see a scale invariant uh, initial spectrum that's slightly tilted, okay? So that slight tilt is the difference between N sub S of one and uh, and um, 0 0.96 or something, 
Okay, and then after Planck, we can clearly uh, measure the initial spectrum. Um, that is um, a power law, first of all, over a pretty broad uh, linear range. And also it's definitely uh, not unity, is deviating from unity by many, many sigma now, I think more than five sigma at this point. And you can imagine inverting this even further, right? You can imagine, you know, it can be a deconvolution or just, uh, just, just inversion. And you can ask yourself, what is the input V of phi? So recall, you need a V of phi, you can draw any V of phi, and it'll produce inflation, or you will not produce inflation. Um, but you can imagine inverting this um, observed, uh, it was calculated, it was processed, uh, but it was observed uh, nevertheless, uh, this observed initial spectrum to get the initial V of phi. And this is the result of that inversion, right? So first angular power spectrum, you invert it to get the initial linear power spectrum. And then you invert that initial linear spectrum again uh, to get the inflation uh, potential. And this is the result of that uh, second inversion. Now, this is measured in V of phi. So the X axis is V and the Y axis is phi. Okay, so this is as direct as it gets in studying the bang of Big Bang. You're experimenting measuring a, a potential field, and we still don't know the actual nature of this potential, but we can measure the, the shape of the, this potential. It has to be very flat, so the curvature has to be small, the slope has to be very, has to be small in order to produce uh, what we observe in the cosmic microwave background. So now you notice uh, in the y-axis is shifted to zero, right? Uh, because you don't really, so this measurement doesn't really tell you the absolute value of V. It's rarely, so in physics, it's rarely, a, you're, you're rarely able to know the absolute level of a potential, right? Because you take the gradient and that's the force and usually uh, objects respond, respond to force, not the absolute potential. Uh, but in gravity, as we all know, um, any shift in potential, all energy form, including potential energy, gravitate. Uh, so you do need to know uh, the, the absolute level of the potential matters uh, in uh, gravitational physics. And, um, but in this um, inversion, you only know the uh, relative shape, right? You, know, you only know the shape of the potential, but you don't know where it is uh, in the vertical axis. Okay. so. And we'll come back to that point uh, later. But um, just to recap, the slightly red uh, spectrum agrees with general prediction of inflation. Uh, in addition, so I'm just going to read this uh, because I don't have time to explain what these are. In addition, the observed fluctuations are adiabatic. Um, so it means it has one single degree of freedom. It's a density fluctuation uh, and it's consistent with fluctuations growing out of a single scalar quantum field. Okay, so there's not a second field, uh, quantum field in play. Uh, otherwise you would, ha would have observed two degrees of freedom, but we observe one degree of freedom uh, per space time point. So the observed distribution is also, Gaul uh, is also highly uh, Gaussian. Uh, it's also consistent with fluctuations going out of a uh, vacuum state of a single scalar quantum field. Um, this is measured in the, the quantity called uh, FNL um, the non-Gaussianity non, uh, non parameter, uh, and it, they're all, you can measure it. There are different types of FNL and they're all consistent with zero. Uh, and also um, the simplest single field slow row inflation so far. So these are all very strong uh, evidence uh, for supporting in support of, uh, of inflation. So uh, in addition, the geometry of the universe has now been constrained to better than um, 1%. Um, and um, you would have thought, you know, with all these uh, supporting evidence, um, inflation is widely accepted. And, and it is correct. Most mainstream uh, astrophysicists, cosmologists, 
have uh, basically voted with their feet and uh, welcome and kind of accept inflation as the paradigm. But there is a minor but very vocal um, resistance to inflation. Sometimes you read about it uh, in, um, in articles and so on. Um, and, um, but, you know, as we recall, inflation is a dynamical process uh, rooted in Big Bang. And um, with that paradigm, we seem to be able to understand uh, the observables. Um, but let me explain why there would be uh, resistance. In addition to what, um, to uh, Fred Hoyle's resistance. So, you know, anything related to creation um, in science, study in science will be met with uh, skepticism and certain level of, uh, uh, of you know, un uncomfortable with, uh, with uh, studying uh, creation of certain scientists being uncomfortable with uh, the study of, uh, of, of creation. Um, but in addition, uh, so inflation is even worse in that regard, uh, because inflation, if you're trying to explain Big Bang with physical processes, with a physical process, um, and if you're successful in doing it, it naturally implies the creation of the universe can happen repeatedly and elsewhere if the same physical conditions are met. Okay, so you're gonna hear some theorists saying very casually, oh, inflation naturally implies what they call multiverse. Um, um, but um, this is really a very, just following a very simple logic here, because, you know, if your inflation is long, long so Big Bang is no longer a one-off thing um, because it's part of physics. And if the, you know, physics laws are universal, and if the same conditions uh, happen again, um, Big Bang happen again and elsewhere. Um, so this is a pretty modern view of, uh, of inflation and Big Bang. And, and we live in one of these bubbles. Okay, so there are these bubbles and um, quantum fluctuations can lead to um, conditions uh, similar to inflation. Uh, and uh, when that condition is met, uh, inflation happened, creating another bubble universe, and we live in one of these. Uh, and that's the suggestion of, uh, of multiverse. So, of course, this um, seems, seems to be logical, but um, when you start talking about other universes, uh, such discussion is, um, is sometimes claimed to be unscientific because you know, it's, it's very hard to imagine you're able to verify that hypothesis. And um, it seems to be out of, outside science, just like Hoyle's objection to Big Bang. Um, but to me, if you can just throw away that philosophy, but just think about logic and physics here, uh, this seems to be pretty logically solid, uh, at least to me, uh, to, to, to consider even this possibility. Another objection to inflation is uh, whether inflation is fine-tuned, <clears throat> okay? So aside from the general opposition to the study of creation, as I said, um, and there are people who criticize multiverse for its lack of predict predictability, um, a more reasonable criticism to inflation has been whether it is natural or fine-tuned, whether, you know, after all, inflation was proposed to explain uh, certain fine-tuned properties in the universe. It looks too uh, homogeneous and isotropic, um, and it, it is some sort of fine-tuning. And it is completely reasonable to ask whether it is meaningful to replace one form of fine-tuning by another, right? Uh, if you can uh, just, if, you, if, you, if you're resorting to fine-tune, a fine-tuned process anyway, uh, it is a reasonable question. So there are two aspects of naturalness uh, and fine tuning of this. So the first one is the initial conditions. Um, if we can't, if the initial conditions required for inflation to happen is rare, okay, um, then this theory is indeed kind of in trouble because you know you're using a rare phenomena to explain the observed uh, fine-tuneness. 
uh, of the universe. And the second question is whether the potential or um, in physics chart, the, the Lagrangian uh, is natural uh, or fine-tuned. So um, recently, um, Roger Penrose got a Nobel Prize uh, for his study of black hole. And uh, one of the sub subjects he liked to talk about is inflation. And he really did not like inflation. Uh, and uh, his uh, criticism to inflation is uh, summarized as, um, you know, it, it's replacing one form of fine tuning by another, basically. Um, and I think he's mostly talking about the uh, initial condition part. So he was first to recognize that, you know, um, Big Bang has very low entropy. And um, so initial condition. So physically, the question is, was the pre-inflationary universe sufficiently homogeneous and isotropic to give rise to inflation? As you recall, inflation was proposed to explain the observed homogeneity uh, and isotropy of our universe. And if the pre-inflationary universe must be you know, homogeneous and isotropic in order for inflation to happen, then the whole thing might be pointless. And that was essentially Penrose's argument. And he has a Nobel Prize. Uh, and we seem, it, it seems to be important to listen to him. Uh, after all, inflation was proposed to address fine tuning. And um, it, is it really uh, meaningful? So fortunately, we can answer this question, not just by trying to talk, talk over each other. Nowadays, you can have numerical relativity code simulation uh, to calculate different initial conditions uh, in 3D uh, and it has arbitrary you know, configuration in it. And you can use that to uh, quantitatively address this question, how uniform uh, the pre-inflationary universe has to be for inflation to happen. Uh, and uh, in a series of papers, uh, these uh, authors uh, seem to conclude that inflation is fairly robust. Uh, it's not very rare. So if you have initial conditions here and there, uh, you can have uh, inflation uh, despite certain level of uh, inhomogeneity uh, and, uh, and isotropy. And the, in it, the, the randomness can be in scalar field uh, and also in tensor. And um, inflation seems to be robust uh, under um, pretty, pretty general uh, scenarios. So it, it is really a significant development over the last a uh, few years, um, and this is over decades of just verbal arguments, right? like pointless, sometimes um, philosophical uh, arguments of whether inflation was natural or unnatural. But nowadays, these are these things are studied by um, young physicists doing numerical relativity now, and now we seem to have a quantitative uh, solution, explanation, answer uh, to this. So I think that address question number one there. So when we published the bicep result a few months ago um, in PRL, uh, Physical Review Letters, um, there was an accompanying um, piece written by a theorist, a theorist um, published online in physics.org. Uh, uh, um, and um, it was a reasonably written uh, paper by a theorist, um, and I didn't think much of it. It was it was good. It was well written. Um, but later on, I realized the title seems to suggest that inflation is in trouble. If you, if you read it in a different way, squeezing down the theory space for cosmic inflation seems to imply that inflation is in trouble um, because of the bicep result of uh, not fighting uh, R or gravitational wave. So, and, and it has become a little worse uh, when there was a CNN article written by Don Lincoln uh, with such title, uh, The Problem with Big Bang Theory. So when I saw the article, I had no idea uh, what this article is about. And I was like, okay, now what? So the problem with Big Bang now, 
And then I read, oh, uh, experiment at the South Pole has recently um, made, made some measurement. And, uh, and I was like, hey, we also have an experiment at the South Pole, not realizing he was talking about BICEP3. Uh, but then I read BICEP3, then by amusement and bemusement became panic, essentially. So I was really shocked to see the BICEP result was interpreted as a failure of cosmic inflation and much worse, a failure of Big Bang Theory. Um, so I feel like it, it is important to set the record straight, okay? So I talked about Planck being able to measure the shape of V of phi, okay? But, but not able to constrain where it is, V of phi, the shape of V of phi the slope, the curvature. Uh, and CMB BMOS directly measures V of phi, uh, because if you recall, uh, the BMO amplitude is proportional to Hubble square, which is proportional to V of phi, okay? So by knowing uh, V, um, you can learn a lot of stuff um, about um, the process of, uh, of inflation. You can place the energy scale of, uh, of inflation where it is. There's Planck scale here. There's the electro weak uh, symmetry breaking, and inflation is somewhere in, in there, uh, probably. And uh, you have to find a field with the correct property uh, to explain um, the observed the observed phenomena in cosmology, basically. So, how is it done? So we go out and measure linear polarization uh, of the cosmic microwave background, and we do component separation. We separate the linear polarization into um, a curl mode like this uh, and a gradient mode like this. And we plot power spectrum. Um, because of a very nice theory, um, linear and scalar fluctuation will not generate the curl mode or the B mode. So by measuring the B mode, uh, you're constraining the primordial gravitational wave. And that's essentially what we did. And if you plot the measurements of BMO spectrum um, by different experiment, uh, you see this, um, you know, our la latest constraint uh, kind of hugs uh, this uh, lensing curve now. Um, and uh, all the other experiments were way, way above uh, this line. So in this line of research, uh, BICEP is really leading the world um, in constraining um, the primordial gravitational waves. Uh, so now we're at sigma r of 0 0.009. Uh, that means uh, at most the fluctuation, uh, initial fluctuation can, can have 1%, roughly 1%, uh, a few percent. Um, tensor, uh, mostly scalar. And um, our constraint in the two observables that I mentioned are uh, the tensor scale ratio, uh, NS, uh, the scalar uh, in uh, power spectrum index uh, is given by this blue region here. And different, if like you can go out and draw different inflationary potentials, and that gives you a prediction uh, on this NS versus R plot. Uh, and a very important landmark of this um, latest result published a few months ago was that we are able to seriously constrain, disfavor these two uh, once very promising models uh, for inflation. So this curve in purple, curve region in purple is called the natural inflation. And uh, this is a monomial um single field uh, inflation um basically v of phi is proportional to phi square phi linearly uh two-third power and so on and they're just uh, following this line and now this is a series of models have been disfavored okay so for the last few years so i believe this is 2014 uh, when we uh, combined BICEP2 with Planck data, and this is the constraint we had. Um, 
BK14. We published this um, three years ago. BK15, shortly after that, less than a year. And then this is our latest result, uh, now disfavoring uh, two very uh, important uh, models, um, the natural inflation and single field slow roll monomial models. So that is not to say all inflation models or the inflationary paradigm is in trouble. There are plenty of models that still can, you know, um, that is still not ruled out, so to speak. Um, for example, um, if you are willing to add another field, uh, you can have a multiple field uh, axial monodromy. So this is a single field axial monodromy that's uh, that's orange here. If you want to add, if you, you're willing to add another field, um, you can move this constraint this way uh, to be more consistent with the observation. There is also a class of model called the alpha attractors that's still perfectly consistent with this, um, mostly because it has a free parameter in it that's un unobserved. So there's still um, essentially infinite number of uh, inflationary models that still fit the observation. Please do not be too quick in blaming inflation theories for being dodgy um, or trying to avoid um, being ruled out. Um, and um, the situation is because um, the high energy physics of um, gravity is not known. And that's why we couldn't pinpoint exactly how inflation happened. Although, we can state with pretty good confidence that something like this must have happened to give us this uh, observed uh, power spectrum uh, in microwave background tensor. <clears throat> microwave background uh, temperature, I should say, temp temperature uh, and uh, EMO polarization. So we can't really blame inflation. In, in fact, this is a very powerful paradigm uh, to uh, explain what we see. So we're trying to find where inflation happened, okay? So we think we know everything um, below electroweak unification. Um, the LHC is doing this sort of physics every day with billions and billions of collisions and um, everything seems to be perfectly explained um, below this energy scale. We think something happened at Pont Epoch um, when gravity must be unified with the rest of the interactions and inflation must happen somewhere in there. It's still vast, um, a many, many orders of magnitude in energy scale. Um, but the thing about inflation is <clears throat> usually um, in physics, if you can't find something, if you can't find in physics, you said the energy is too small, the interaction is too small, right? So in particle physics, combined with inflation, you can't really do that. You can't say, okay, we didn't discover inflation above certain energy scale because inflation is a very, very low energy scale. But on the other hand, um, we think we know everything at low energy scale. So particle physics and inflation kind of comes in and sandwich uh, together constrain um, the physics of particle and field uh, jointly. So um, after we kind of rule out these uh, models, I try to understand what these models are. So for example, the purple uh, region that was um, dis heavily disfavored is called natural inflation. Um, this was proposed in 1990s, uh, 1990, um, as a way to give inflation naturally a flat potential. It was not easy to uh, give um, something uh, in gravitational physics a flat potential, it turns out. And they just imagine um, a process very similar to the Higgs process uh, and also the axiom process. Um, uh, if you tilt a Mexican head of uh, potential, it naturally have a flat direction. And that could, could be uh, uh, inflaton potential uh, 
and uh, it was uh, what they call technically uh, technically natural. So they call it technical. Uh, they they call it uh, natural inflation. So um, and now you know this uh, very influential model was rolled out uh, pretty conclusively um, by the latest bicep result. And the two uh, most influential contemporary models are the uh, string motivated axion monodromy model that was I was mentioning, uh, and also the supergravity inspired uh, alpha attractor models. So I'm not a theorist myself, but generally um, these uh, theorists, what they're trying to do is to avoid um, high level fine tuning to find a natural way to generate uh, these inflation potentials. And they wanna see if their um, uh, unified theory or their quantum gravity container theory, string theory or supergravity uh, can accommodate such an inflaton uh, field uh, in their model, okay? So they're not just trying to draw a mathematical function and try to match the observation because um, a high school student can do that. So they're they're not just just doing that. They're trying to see if they can uh, accommodate inflation in uh, string theory or supergravity naturally, often. Um, and um, and there's a huge amount of literature on this. Um, but um, what I came to understand is um, they care about the theorists, care about the field range for phi um, of which, um, during which inflation happened, not just the, uh, the vertical, the potential, um, the energy scale of inflation, um, but also the field range. Um, during which inflation happened, the delta phi. Um, but for single field, a uh, simple integral um, relate the two. So once you know absolute V um, and you know the Hubble scale and you require, you know, certain number of E folding uh, for inflation uh, to explain the observed uh, density fluctuation and so on, um, you have of uh, uh, uncertain, uh, you have um, related the V of phi, uh, V, the potential, uh, and delta phi, which is the, the field range during inflation. And the reason they care about it is naturally, um, you expect in unknown physics, unknown unified quantum gravity physics, you naturally expect um, the field to have rapid fluctuations over Planck scale. But for inflation to happen, uh, you need that to be very flat, okay? So this is what you naturally expect. And for inflation to happen, um, you need this, okay? You need a fairly flat uh, potential. And that's why they're struggling to come up with um, um, unified theory uh, to explain inflation because you naturally get this, um, but this is what's required. A flat potential is, is, is what's required, which turned out to be a pretty uh, fine tuned. So, you know, that, that was a 20 minutes uh, exposition on the naturalness of inflation. Uh, so the conclusion seems to be um, the initial condition is fairly natural for inflation, um, but the potential seems to be pretty, uh, a little bit fine tuned at least. Uh, quite fine-tuned to ex to give rise to the inflation that we observe uh, is my take of uh, of this. So I'm running low in time, but uh, I think it's worth uh, reviewing what fine-tuning means uh, in physics. So in physics, uh, fine-tuning or the opposite of that is naturalness is often defined um, in such a way. So everything um, Gelman says in physics, not everything not forbidden uh, is forced on you. So unless you have a reason to believe a dimensionless number is zero because of symmetry, um, that number is naturally of order unity, um, not 10 to the minus 10, um, 
Uh, so it was explained in a slightly different way that dimensionless quantity in nature in nature should be small unless the underlying theory um, has a symmetry that forces it to be small. Okay. So I'm running low on time, but um, using that definition, we can take a look at the, um, let me just skip these few slides. Um, that also kind of remind us, you know, um, the, the inflation potential seems to be uh, flat. Um, and, uh, and a bit fine-tuned. Okay, I'm running out of time. So let, let me skip these slides. Um, so this is um, the cross-sectional view of our telescope. I didn't spend too much time talking about these, um, but uh, I talked about these uh, two years ago, uh, three years ago. Um, these are microwave telescopes measuring polarization states, and we do it at the South Pole. And um, and uh, so far, we've published results uh, using data um, taken up to uh, the end of 2018. And um, since then, we have accumulated three more years of data, and we expect um, the uncertainty on R to reduce by another factor of uh, a few. But then we, if you recall, the power spectrum that we published is already hugging the lensing line. So we have to de-lens um, to be able to get better results. Uh, and uh, we're working jointly with the South Pole Telescope <clears throat> data. Um, so this is the BICEP series, and this is the South Pole Telescope with the larger aperture. You can measure lensing better, and you can predict the amount of uh, lensing contamination uh, at a degree scale and remove that uh, in a process known as de-lensing. And um, by the end of this program, we should be able to add uh, two or three times 10 to the minus three, which is a factor of a few uh, smaller than what we have. So we'll be able to shrink that uh, uncertainty uh, contour uh, by another factor of uh, three, roughly, in the next few years uh, in the vertical direction, uh, constraining inflation further. But the two attempts to naturally explain uh, infl the flatness of inflation, so the first one is called the axiom monodromy, um, that's the monomial uh, inflationary, uh, uh, single field monomial monomial potential and the natural inflation uh, have now been ruled out. And um, we're left with uh, inflation with, um, you know, like not a very natural, uh, naturally explained uh, flatness uh, in potential. So in order to achieve that, we're building three more receivers, a lot more detectors, um, and um, we, should, we will deploy these three receivers in addition to jointly analyze the data with uh, SPT. And um, this is the de-lensing pipeline. You measure the deflection field uh, from lensing, and then you predict um, the amount of low L contamination in BMOs. And essentially you do a multi-component uh, separation, including uh, this uh, lensing contamination as template to remove it. So the bottom line is in the next few years, um, we will be able to shrink this uh, by another factor of three. Um, so the natural inflation line is gone. So it's way out here. Uh, and um, the current limit is in blue now. Now we're zooming in. Uh, vertically, and um, in the next few years, we should be able to uh, either detect R if R is around 0 0.01 or constrain it further, um, leaving um, fewer uh, models uh, to be consistent with, um, with the observation. So going back, just let me just summarize. <laughs> so this is the way I see it. Um, the unexplained, Fine-tuning in physics seems to be piling up. Um, so if you're keeping track of these, um, you recall 
cosmological constant seems to be too small compared to naturally predicted uh, level. Uh, so famously, that was explained by uh, anthropic uh, arguments um, pretty early on uh, by Weinberg. Um, and uh, all the other explanations seems to be a little not, not as widely uh, accepted. Um, there's the Higgs mass uh, being too small compared to Planck mass. Um, people invented a new symmetry to explain it, and that was supersymmetry. It was not discovered by LHC, uh, and yet, you know, it could be explained by a similar uh, anthropic argument. And inflation is about creation of the world and everything, all the particles in it, all the materials, all the power spectrum, of course, uh, and it seems to be some sort of fine tuning might be unavoidable in the potential, uh, even though the initial condition uh, seems to be natural. Um, so like all these things seem to require some sort of fine tuning and, um, and they could be explained uh, by uh, observational uh, selection effect, uh, also known as an uh, anthropic uh, principle. So this is a, you know, not very widely advertised uh, fine tuning problem in physics It's called the strong CP. Um, and this one seems to defy all anthropic explanations. And the solution to this is a new particle called the axion, which is also a dark matter candidate uh, that I got very interested in uh, in recent years. So I'm running out of time. I just wanna put these things in perspective. So uh, physicists tend to hate uh, fine tuning uh, and um, you know, propo proposing new symmetries, proposing new processes to explain fine tuning. And um, we seem to be making progress uh, in these directions. So I don't have time to explain a strong CP problem, but I just wanna, mention very quickly that uh, axion seem to interact uh, axion interact with uh, inflation in a very interesting way. Um, so the lack of isocurvature fluctuation, um, the constraint uh, on isocurvature fluctuation by Planck uh, divide the allowed uh, axion parameter space, the particle needed to explain the strong CP problem into two regions. <clears throat> and um, these two regions have very interesting um, differences. And um, it turns out um, the relevant uh, mass range uh, for axion to be dark matter um, seems to be in the microwave as well. So all the techniques that we developed to measure cosmic microwave background polarizations could be applicable uh, to uh, search search for axion dark matters. So during the pandemic, uh, I wrote uh, a few papers about this, and um, we proposed structures uh, that are able to study, in particular, this classical window, um, which uh, could um, explain uh, both um, could, could could both pin pin down both inflation uh, and uh, dark matter. So I'm running out of time, but let me just quickly summarize. So the common theme in my talk is what used to be unknowable are no longer unknowable, are becoming like mainstream uh, topics in science. So if you are an astronomy student, you know the first one. So um, a philosopher thought it was not possible to ever know the chemical composition of the stars and planets. Uh, so as scientists, you know, we have no problem just uh, taking this guy down. He's a philosopher anyway. Um, but what about Einstein? Einstein didn't think it was possible, ever be possible to see an atom or even to given an objective reality. And of course, nowadays we can see atoms all the time. And he didn't think it was possible to detect gravitational waves. And obviously it was detected a few years ago. He didn't think it was possible to detect frame dragging predicted by his own general theory of relativity. And of course, it was observed again a few years ago. So this lesson seems to be, while it seems to be reasonable to demand scientific theory to be testable, it is difficult to, to, difficult to predict uh, what's testable and what's not just in a few decades. Um, 
So in general, we seem to be pushing this rim of uh, unknown further and further out, trying to explain everything, uh, including the creation. So I'll stop and take questions. OK, thank you very much. And you know, thanks for sharing uh, this latest results with us. So um, if you have any questions, please you know, either speak up directly or type them in the chat box so I can see it. OK, there's OK, Ding Wen. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. A very nice talk. I just wondering uh, whether or not in the future we can direct the primordial gravitational wave through the gravitational wave detectors. And if so, what kind of information we can obtain through the measurement of gravitational wave uh, compared to the BMO polarization? So I don't have that plot now, but the answer is possibly. So inflationary process produce, predicts a nearly scale invariant uh, spectrum of, um, of gravitational waves and um, all the way up to um, um, much higher frequency. So the gravitational wave we're trying to measure is a very, very low frequency, right? So the wavelength is like cosmological scale, um, but um, uh, inflation does predict um, higher frequency. You know, it's nearly scale invariant um, gravitational waves, and it's not going to be able to de be detected by the current generation, uh, like LIGO events, LIGO or even LISA. Um, but uh, people have talked about a conceptual project in space called the Big Bang Observer, um, also using multiple air uh, spacecraft um, laser interferometry um, with much longer baseline using the entire solar system. <clears throat> and um, that could have the sensitivity to detect the inflationary gravitational wave um, in, um, uh, in, uh, directly uh, in laser interferometry. So that will give you a very, very long lever arm uh, in linear scale. Uh, and measure uh, n sub t, the primordial spectrum index for tensor, much better. But it is a predictable effect. It has a predictable amplitude, uh, but it seems very, very, very hard, uh, like several generations beyond the current capability. So do you know what kind of frequency we are expecting for this? It, it's broadband. It's broadband. It, it should have, you know, frequency, you know, from like a year or all the way to even higher frequency. Okay. Yeah. So it's possible, maybe in future. But it just, is possible, uh, but it's it's very very, futuristic. Okay. it's very futuristic. It's very futuristic. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So other questions. So is there any like other test or experiment that can use to, you know, to detect this inflation, like in addition to this polarization or you know, gravitational wave detectors? Uh, so, so um, the main observables were really R and NS, okay? So you can imagine the next derivative, next order derivative, right? Second order derivative, and you can imagine what if you know there is a third order derivative, um, and that will introduce a running of spectral index, meaning the spectral index would change from this to something else as you go to a higher, a higher L or higher wave number. Um, so that could uh, be detected. So one could imagine shrinking the uncertainty on NS. Um, this is a Planck result. Um, if you survey the entire sky in E modes, um, this uncertainty will be reduced. Um, but it's not going to be orders of magnitude smaller than this. Um, the spherics um, mission 
should be able to shrink NS uh, and also the running of spectral index. Uh, and also, I mentioned very briefly Gaussianity uh, of, uh, of the initial fluctuation uh, is, deep, is deeply related to inflation. But also, one can imagine constraining the isocurvature better. The isocurvature is this extra degrees of freedom, extra degree of freedom uh, in, uh, in the um, acoustic oscillations, basically. So the current result is the current constraints coming from Planck, and you can imagine measuring emo polarization better uh, to constrain that. Um, so it introduces, I didn't get to this slide, but uh, it introduces a phase shift um, added to the observed uh, curve. So the what's observed right now is the dashed. I don't know why they picked dash as the standard, but uh, the dash is the standard. And the new components are all phase shifted with respect to the dash. And these are the different isocurvature modes. Um, and they are all constrained to less than a few percent. And one can imagine measuring this emo polarization better uh, to constrain that. Um, so th those are the things I can think of. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, we have one. Oh, please speak up. Uh, hi, uh, Charlie. Yeah, this is King Wang. Yeah, nice talk. Uh, just ask a very general question. We are. Uh, we are constructing experiment to uh, pursue for the R, the ratio. Uh, we will stop at some small number, or we can keep going. Right. So that question has two possible answers, right? So um, one is just the reality of uh, experimental uh, capability. Oh, you can still hear me, right? Um, yes. And we're already, even the bicep keck experiment is already limited by lensing, right? Um, so with three more receivers at different frequencies and de-lensing with SPT, we should be able to reduce that by a factor of uncertainty by a factor, not a factor of three uh, in the next few years. So, but after that, we're talking about scaling up bicep keg, bicep array, and SPT by another order of magnitude to be able to you know, shrink the uh, uncertainty further because we've been integrating for a long time and the next big jump must come from sensitivity, not just for, not just integrating for longer, right? We're pretty much uh, reaching um, diminishing return uh, at this point. So we need to increase the sensitivity by a factor of 10, and that's why the next generation experiment must have 100,000 100, detectors. Uh, and that's um, CMBS-4 uh, in the US or the space missions being mm -hmm. talked about um, to give us another factor of 10. And that'll take 10, 20 years. Um, so that's the practical limit uh, of this business. So beyond that, even beyond that, reaching 10 to minus four seems to be uh, prohibitive um, in, in, because you, you just need so many detectors uh, to, to foreground separation for de-lensing uh, and uh, the project will become too expensive. Mm -hmm. So the theoretical answer, the, the answer on the theoretical side is, is there a landmark worth reaching, right? Um, and you know, you get different answers from different people, you probably have your own uh, favorite model down there. Um, but, um, you know, there's uh, the so-called Starobinsky model at a few times 10 to the minus three, uh, that might be a reasonable target. <clears throat> um, and, you know, CMBS4 could, or, you know, it, it'll be hard, but in principle should be able to reach that. Um, but, you know, as far as I know, there's a spectrum of theoretical predictions um, at different level of fine tuning, if you will, uh, all the way down to um, zero. 
And uh, it's still a perfectly reasonable inflationary model, depending on how much fine tuning you're willing to accept. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, other questions? Okay, if, if there are no more questions, I think um, that'll be the end of this talk. Thanks, darling, again for this exciting talk and you know, thanks for staying with us. I know it's pretty late in California. You're, you're not still not in California, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and thanks for you know, all the audience here for partic participating in this event. Uh, so you know, just an advertisement here. So there's another NCU Delta online talk uh, this Friday given by Professor Stella Offner. So she's a awardee of this year. So I would encourage everyone to join. So it's, it's going to be another fantastic talk. I think. Okay. Thanks again for you know, for uh, today's talk. Okay. I'll Bye. see you guys um, in the future. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.